Welcome to Road to 250. Today we'll talk about the basal ganglia, Parkinson's disease, and then the drugs associated with Parkinson's. So let's get right into it. So basal ganglia, the function is to modify voluntary movements. It receives cortex input and then provides feedback to the cortex uh, to either stimulate motor activity or inhibit motor activity. And the combination of a stimulation and inhibition is what gives you a complex movement. So here, what you want to keep in mind is uh, the importance of basal ganglia. So the things that we'll cover will be like substantia nigra, uh, subthalamic nucleus. Then you also have your putamen and your globus, pal globus pallidus. There's the external and internal. And if you put the putamen with the globus pallidus, it forms a lentiform nucleus. And also, you have your caudate nucleus right up here. So if you get a scan, you want to make sure that you know where these things are located, kind of gener generally. And um, so again, like I said, it's important for voluntary movements and making postural adjustments, and it will receive cortical input. So the things that you want to make sure you know, striatum is basically your putamen, which is the motor and your caudate, which is your cognitive sense. And then the lentiform is your putamen plus your globus pallidus. So if anything, keep those two in mind because they play a big role for in many disease processes. Um, so the way I think about this slide here is basically you're doing a motor uh, movement. So think about playing a guitar or like using a guitar chord. So when you're playing a guitar chord, you have certain muscles that you need and then other muscles that you don't need. So initially you'll get a premotor cortex which decides to execute a movement and that'll basically activate your basal ganglia and it can go in either way. It can activate the direct pathway which activates the muscles that are, that are required to play that chord. And then you also have an indirect pathway and these will be inhibiting motor for muscles that you're basically don't need to play that chord. So by stimulating and inhibiting, you're doing a complex movement. So that's what I meant with the previous slide where doing a stimulation and inhibition leads to a complex movement. And I'll talk about the direct and indirect pathways coming up in a few slides. So the thing you want to take from this slide here is basically the basal ganglia connection. So you have your cortex, which is going to stimulate your striatum, and the cortex wants it wants to stimulate the brainstem and the spinal cord. But at rest, why doesn't it do that? Because you have your globus pallidus internus and your pars reticulata that are basically signaling GABA, which is uh, an inhibitory, you know, an inhibitory signal. So when it's sending these signals to the thalamus, it basically does not give any sort of movement for the cortex. So this is why at rest you have no motion. And that's basically due to this GABA. Um, I'm not going to use this picture for what my explanations are, but um, this just gives you a general idea as to what's happening um, at rest. So before I get into um, the actual pathway of direct and indirect, I wanted to review dopamine. So dopamine is a G-protein coupled receptor. So the D1 is a GS receptor, and basically it relaxes renal vascular smooth muscle, but also, also activates your direct pathway. And then your D2 um, inhibits the indirect pathway. So the way you can think about this is the D1 will activate or stimulate the direct pathway to the striatum, while the D2 will inhibit the indirect pathway. So just to keep that in mind, but also make sure you know that it's a GS or a GI based on the G-coupled protein receptors. So this is a slide that I'm going to mainly focus on as far as how you have a direct um, pathway and an indirect pathway. So as I said before, the cortex basically sends um, a s signal to the striatum which is a glutamate, which is an excitatory signal. So what happens here, and we're going to focus for the first half of this, we're just going to focus on the direct pathway. Um, and then 
will go to the indirect pathway after. So as the cortex stimulates the agglutamate to the striatum, what it's going to do is it sends a GABAergic neuron or GABA to the globus pallidus internal segment and the substantia nigra pars reticulata. And if you remember what I said, that these two are already sending out a GABA to the thalamus to basically not do any sort of movement. But by doing GABA to a GABA, what you're doing is disinhibition. So it's inhibiting a neuron that's also inhibiting the neuron. So it's inhibiting the inhibitor, if that makes sense. So by giving GABA once and doing GABA twice, it basically means it's a excitatory signal. So then the thalamus will send an excitatory signal back to the cortex saying, hey, move. So in a, in a sense, that's how the direct pathway works. Um, and the other thing is your substantia niagara pars compacta is also sending dopamine or dopamine back or the D1 to the striatum, which is stimulating the direct pathway. So know that as far as the direct pathway that you're having GABA once and twice. By having two GABAs in a row, you're inhibiting the inhibitor, which then equals um, an excitatory signal. Everyone cool with that so far? Mm -hmm. All right, so now let's talk about um, the indirect pathway, and I'll just change the color, so we'll keep that still here. So the cortex, again, cortex again is going to send glutamate, which is an excitatory signal, to the striatum. However, you instead of the D1 receptor here, which normally is going to is what's going to tell it to go to the direct pathway. Um, you have acetylcholine, which is basically going to guide this thing to the indirect side. But uh, the striatum, which has a different set of GABA neurons and basically different receptors of GABA, will then affect the globus pallidus external segment. Um, so when it goes to this side, it's a blocker, so GABA. And what the globus pallidus external segment does, it also has GABA, which basically sends GABA neurons to the subthalamic nucleus. So what we did here, again, is the same thing. We we're disinhibition. So disinhibiting it, which, well, the subthalamic nucleus will send glutamate, which is an excitatory signal, to the globus pallidus internal segment. But the globus pallidus internal segment is known to release GABA. So when it releases GABA back to the thalamus, it basically inhibits movement or suppresses the movement. So... Yes, we did a disinhibition here by giving an excitatory signal, but at the same time, we have one more step, which is the GABA, which basically suppresses um, motor activity. So in the bottom here, it's written, the direct pathway, which is the, the right side, is basically to drive motor cortex and promote movement, and that is enhanced by DOPA. So you have your dopamine 1 and dopamine 2, uh, however, if the indirect pathway, its job is to inhibit motor cortex and suppresses movement, and that is enhanced by acetylcholine. So there is two different things. So the things that you want to remember are glutamate and GABA are the two receptors that will um, help with the movement or non no movement. And then the other two receptors you want to know are acetylcholine and dopamine. So those two play a big factor. Um, Any questions about that? You were, you were banging it out there for a little bit, actually. All right, so what did you miss? <clears throat> Are you missing the indirect pathway? Okay, so I can redo the indirect pathway. All right, so for the indirect pathway, your cortex will send glutamate to the striatum. That stays the same which is an excitatory signal. However, the striatum has um, different sets of GABA neurons, and this is driven by acetylcholine. So when you see acetylcholine, it basically affects GABA on a different set of receptors than the GABA that it would affect in the direct pathway. So the striatum will then send the GABA uh, neurons to the globus pallidus external segment, which in then also release GABA to the uh, subthalamic nucleus. So we have a 
basically two GABA neurons in a series. It's called disinhibition. So inhibiting the inhibitor, which leads to an excitatory signal by the subthalamic nucleus to release glutamate. So by releasing glutamate, which is an excitatory signal, it affects the globus pallidus internal segment, which um, its job is to release GABA to the thalamus, and that will basically lead to uh, no motor movement or suppression of movement. Um, and again, like I said, it inhibits the motor cortex, suppresses movement, and is enhanced by acetylcholine. Yes? No? Yeah, that was better. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other questions? We can move on. All right. So this is from the first aid, um, 2018. Uh, this is a slight bit different than how kind of Kaplan did it, is what the picture was from Kaplan. Um, here, the, the way the wording is is kind of confusing. But the motor cortex, again, is sending signal to the striatum. However, you're also getting um, from the sub, um, substantia nigra, you're also getting dopamine receptors who are basically telling to go the direct pathway to facilitate movement or the indirect pathway which inhibits movement. So the direct uh, excitatory pathway basically is the substantia nigra input stimulates the striatum and then that release of GABA which inhibits GABA release from the GPI and that in itself inhibiting the inhibitor is disinhibition, the thalamus, and that will increase the motor. Uh, function. But the indirect pathway, which is the inhibitory pathway, is your substantia nigra stimulates the striatum, but releasing GABA, which inhibits the sub, uh, subthalamic nucleus with a GPE inhibition, and then the subthalamic nucleus stimulates the GPI, which then release GABA to inhibit the thalamus. So uh, this is if you kind of pay attention and go through this, it kind of makes sense. So this is your direct pathway this way, and then the indirect has that one extra step before it goes this way. Um, and again, dopamine binds to D1, which stimulates the excitatory pathway, and D2, which does the inhibitory pathway, and that will increase the motion. All right. So... So pathologies associated with this um, topic with basal ganglia, you can have Wilson's disease, Huntington's, Parkinson's, and in the subthalamic nucleus, this is due to the lacunar stroke, um, and that's hemibolism. Um, so what we're going to basically talk about today is Parkinson's disease. So Parkinson's disease is basically a degenerative loss of dopaminergic neurons, and the substantia nigra of basal ganglia. And it's a common disorder that related to aging, so about 2% of the adults. And histology would show uh, loss of pigmented neurons and round eosinophilic inclusions or alpha synuclein. And I have a picture of that on the next slide. So clinical features. Can you guys tell me some of the clinical features for Parkinson's? Rolling pill, tremor. Rolling pill, pill rolling. Pete, I think you were saying something. Um, so you have a tremor, which is the. <laughs> yeah, that's there. Um, get rigidity, akinesia, bradykinesia, and then you have postural instability, and then shuffling gait. And that's what TRAPS stands for. These are the clinical features that you would see. Um, if dementia is a common feature of late, of late disease, if dementia is early onset, what does that suggest to you? If the patient who has dementia with Parkinsonian features but the dementia is in the early onset. Louis body? Yeah, yeah it's dementia. a Louis body dementia. So just keep that differential in mind. 
So this is from First Aid. Um, something new that they've added this in 2018 is that you have to rule out depression as a cause of dementia, um, and it's called pseudo dementia. Didn't know that, but um, so the things that we talked about again, this is your alpha synuclein, so intercellular eosinophilic inclusions, um, and then obviously we talked about the traps in the previous slide. But you have the loss of dopaminergic neurons of the substantia nigra pars compacto. And one other thing that I was going to add, um, this MT or MPTP, um, it basically its job is to destroy dopamine neurons. And it was in the past used to be a contaminant of opioid drugs. I'm not sure much about it anymore, but something to keep in mind because there's some questions that still have the MPTP as a possible question type. Um, so the classical case would be like an older male patient and then the average onset of a patient who has Parkinson's probably about 60. Okay. Um, so if no one has questions, we'll talk about the drugs and go from there. So Parkinson's disease drugs, obviously, if you need to know the BALSA, which is bromocryptine, amantadine, levodopa, selegiline, and antimuscarinics, but we will talk about a few more um, in this. So there is a list of treatments that can possibly be given for Parkinson's, as the list is long. Um, and before you say beta blocker here, it's usually just given for the tremor. Um, and... Bromocryptine is like a peripheral vasoconstrictor, so um, just know these drug names, but we'll go over some of these in detail in the next couple of slides. So levodopa, carbidopa, uh, cinemet is the name of what they call it now. So levodopa basically crosses the blood-brain barrier and is converted to dopamine in the CNS via dopa decarboxylase. Um, peripheral D, uh, peripheral decarboxylase can break down L-DOPA, but uh, this is the limit its benefits. So it creates peripheral dopamine, which can't cross the blood-brain barrier, and that can cause uh, heart side effects and also can cause nausea and vomiting because you have the vomiting centers outside the blood-brain barrier. So if you have L-DOPA conversion outside to dopamine, you'd get some side effects. Um, carbidopa basically inhibits that peripheral decarboxylase enzyme, so it's usually given together with L-DOPA, carbidopa, and you can still get CNS side effects of L-DOPA when it becomes dopamine in the CNS, such as anxiety, agitation, and insomnia. So you want to try to use the lowest lower dose possible, and I'll explain why in the next slide. Um, in the past, it was showed that you want to avoid B6 because what B6 does, it promotes the conversion of uh, L-DOPA to dopamine on the periphery. However, with the, uh, in modern days with the carbidopa, it's not much of a problem if people take B6, but just keep that in mind for questions where you may run across that. Something interesting I learned. So... L-DOPA, carbidopa has a, if, if you have a long-term use of this drug, it has motor side effects. Um, the drug reduces natural L-DOPA production in our bodies, and it can cause an on-off phenomenon. So you can get akinesia between the doses, or you can get dyskinesia or involuntary movement. So this is why you want to try to lose, use the lowest dose possible just to avoid um, these side effects. So directly from first aid, um, L-DOPA can cross the blood-brain barrier, and it's converted by DOPA decarboxylase of the CNS to dopamine. And again, like I said, carbidopa is a peripheral DOPA decarboxylase inhibitor. So that's given to increase the bioavailability. Uh, adverse effects, nausea, hallucinations, um, postural hyper hypotension from peripheral formations of catecholamines, and then obviously, as we said, long-term use can lead to dyskinesia uh, following administration of on-off phenomena. So 
stuff we've talked about. Um, Tolcapone and entocapone um, basically inhibit the COMPT, uh, which is an enzyme that breaks down L-DOPA to 3-O-methyl DOPA. And even with carbidopa, these COMPTs limit the L-DOPA benefits, but it only works in combination with L-DOPA. So there's a difference in first aid to what my slides say here, because I didn't realize till very late, but the 2018, they don't have tolcapone as a possible drug given for um, Parkinson's. It's only entocapone, and apparently entocapone can do both periphery and central COMPT inhibition. Because tolcapone has such a high hepatotoxicity, so it was kind of dis used or wasn't used much and now it's kind of coming back but you want to check your lfts if you're going to give tocopone um, and i'm not sure if anybody has any more details about that um selegiline is um, maob inhibitor so what maob does it does a central dopamine breakdown enzyme so it breaks down dopamine more than 5-ht3 or 5-ht so it increases central dopamine levels by giving selegiline, you would increase your central dopamine levels, and it can be added to L-dopa, carbidopa. But the side effects for these, these drugs are nausea, vomiting, hypotension, and then you may get excessive daytime sleepiness. And serotonin syndrome, obviously, um, when you give this drug with an SSRI, you can get confusion, fever, and myoclonus. And what we they like to say cheese effect with tyramine foods, tyramine foods being like red wine, aged cheese, or aged meats. Um, but they said cheese effect because initially it was people who used to take SSRIs and or MAO B inhibitors and go eat pizza. So uh, basically, tyramine foods can cause hypertensive crisis because MAOs block the breakdown of tyramine. So if you have excess tyramine, you're going to get hypertension. Um, and MAOA, which are used for depression, and MAOBs can be used for um, Parkinson's. So this is from First Aid. It's an adjuncting agent to L-DOPA in treatment of Parkinson's and then may enhance the effects of L-DOPA. That's another possible side effect. So this is like a kind of like a review sheet, if you want to say. Um, this is outside in the periphery, and then this is inside. So L-dopa can only cross in the blood-brain barrier. Um, carbidopa blocks it from breaking down outside. Then you have your COMT inhibitors that can basically stop the conversion of L-dopa to the inactive form. And once it crosses, obviously, it converts to dopamine, but you can use other drugs to basically stop L-DOPA from being converted to the inactive form so that it can convert to dopamine. However, first aid drug, uh, first aid picture is kind of very beneficial as well, so I'll show you that in a, in a slide. But something that I wanted to add, when you're doing Parkinson's drugs just in practice, so the tremor predominates any symptom, so then you're going to give trihexyphenyldale, um, which is an anti-muscarinic drug. And the side effect for that may be sedation or dry mouth. And if you have bradykinesia and rigidity, uh, you may want to add like a dopamine agonist, uh, primipexol as one. And then obviously the last choice would be levodopa, carbidopa. Um, so if things don't work or the drugs are ineffective, then you can switch to levodopa, carbidopa. But you can start with these if... Um, you have just tremor or you have bradykinesia, rigidity. And this is from Kaplan. Um, dopamine receptor agonists such as bromocryptine um, not only can be used in hypoprolactinemia and acromegaly, but it also kind of has an effect here. And primipexol and ruperinol um, can be used. And then benztropine and trihexyphenidyl are the drugs that decrease the acetylcholine function. So they're muscarinic blockers and their action is to decrease the tremor and rigidity but have little effects on the bradykinesia. So side effects would be like an atropine, so sedation, dry mouth. 
And then amantadine, which is an antiviral drug, it blocks muscarinic receptors and increases dopamine release. So it's like a squeezing out effect. And the side effects of this would be atropine-like and libido reticularis. So this is a picture from first aid that you guys can use. Um, I kind of, this is pretty good. Uh, as we talked about with the COMP inhibitors and the DOPA decarboxylase inhibitors in the periphery, and then once it comes inside central, and centrally you can, again, give selegiline or anticapone and dopamine ag agonists such as bromocryptine or pranol, pramiprexol. And then amantadine will just increase dopamine availability. So it's a good way to put it all together. And this, basically, I've kind of talked about amantadine. I've talked about L-dopa availability, but just for complete sake, I put this in here. Um, and then curbed excess cholinergic activity, such as benztropine, or just antimuscarinic, improves the tremor and rigidity, but doesn't really affect the bradykinesia. So you can think of Park My Benz or Mercedes Benz as a mnemonic for that. So if nobody has any questions, that's all I got today.